You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. There are still a number of older, overlooked recordings that I'm in the process of remastering, so I'll be publishing another handful this month. The first of these is the Frederick Webster tale, Rats, in which a chap by the name of Mike Halliday is determined to make the most of a challenging holiday in dreary England. We hope you enjoyed this one, folks. Rats by F. A. M. Webster The light of a campfire revealed a pleasant scene. Two big white caravans and three cars stood parked, up to their hubs in lush meadow grass. Behind lay the hills and the long white road. In front was a swiftly flowing stream, in which the caravanners had washed the dust of the road from their bodies at the end of a long hot day. Mike Halliday lit his pipe and uttered a sigh of sheer satisfaction, as he lay back in a battered old rocky chair. A giant of a man, home from East Africa on leave, this was the sort of life he knew and loved. From the water's edge, a chorus of frogs croaked discordantly. Upon the steps of a caravan, Mary Halliday sat, and, in her arms, lay her year-old son, Hector, kicking and crooning contentedly, as, with solemn eyes, he regarded a big yellow moon, across which a rack of black-bellied clouds raced continually. Sir Edward Fanshaw, flannel-clad and tidy, emerged from his tent, a sardonic smile upon his features, as his eyes encountered the spectacle of his old school friend, whose sun-bleached khaki shorts and bush blouse furnished a sharp contrast to his own immaculate attire. Lady Fanshaw peered out over her husband's shoulder. "'Rain before morning, Mike,' suggested the baronet, with a glance for the cloud-obscured moon. "'I fancy you'll be sorry you did not bring some thicker clothing. I love my old khaki and the freedom of movement it gives me,' Mike answered, stretching his limbs. "'There's no adventurous risk in England, but one likes to dress the part.' "'Even to the hunting-knife,' Sir Edward chuckled. "'Do you carry a revolver as well?' Mike's cheeks flushed, as his hand stole beneath the skirt of his bush-blouse, which had a small holster and buckled to his belt. "'It's sheer force of habit,' he apologised. "'Do be careful, Mr. Halliday,' interposed Lady Fanshawe nervously. "'I am scared to death of firearms.' "'Jolly useful things where I come from,' growled Mike. "'And even in England, well, one never knows.' A squeak and a scurry in the rushes close at hand attracted their attention, and little Hector ceased staring at the moon to listen. "'Rats, that's another sign of bad weather,' pronounced Mike Halliday indifferently. "'Rats! How horrible! I simply loathe rats!' exclaimed Lady Fanshawe, with difficulty repressing a scream. Mary smiled quietly. The years she had spent with her husband, far beyond the fringes of civilization, had driven out fear. Baby Hector continued to croon contentedly to himself. Soon after midnight, the storm burst. Mike Halliday was awakened by the sound of the rain lashing down onto the roof of his canvas lean-to, and, for some moments, lay listening to the exultant croaking of the frogs, so loud that it rose above the fury of the storm. Outside, in the darkness, the river bank was alive with voles, and in every old house in Burford, half a mile away, rats were stirring, for rodents of a peculiar prescience where bad weather is concerned. Striking camp the next morning was not a pleasant business. Merciless rain had turned the beauty of the lush green meadow into a veritable quagmire. There were wet tents and sodden bedding to be stored away. Sir Edward's once immaculate flannels clung to his long thin limbs, and Lady Fanshawe never ceased grumbling. Only Mike and Mary remained cheerful, although they were as completely drenched as their companions. Baby Hector howled dismally. The poor mite of humanity, born in tropical sunshine, was not enjoying his first taste of an English summer. By dint of much manhandling, and with the aid of half a dozen farm labourers, the cars and caravans were at last disinterred from the now muddy field, and got on to the highway. Halfway up the hill through Burford Town, however, 
Mike Halliday's car jibbed at the weight of the caravan behind it, and could not be moved until further manual aid was enlisted. "'Commend me to England for a happy holiday,' he growled, as, flopping down into the pool of water which filled the driving seat, he took the road to Gloucester. "'Perhaps the weather will break presently,' said Mary, seeking, hopefully, to find grounds for offering consolation to her very cold and wet husband. But the weather did not break. All day long the wind-driven rain lashed at the windows and side curtains of the caravans and cars. A cold lunch was prepared and eaten in damp discomfort, and did nothing to raise the spirits of the disgruntled wayfarers. Mike and Mary were dourly determined to go on. Sir Edward was openly doubtful about the wisdom of doing so, and Lady Fanshawe, totally unaccustomed to any form of hardship, was almost tearful. Baby Hector continued to howl dismally and, down in the valleys, where the rivers already were overflowing their banks, legions of rats, storm-wise in their generation, were beginning to desert their ancient homes, in the hope of finding safer and drier quarters. "'I vote that we stop at the next town, and put up for the night at a decent hotel,' Sir Edward suggested diffidently. "'That be damned for a tale,' Mike answered. "'If you come caravanning, you've got to take the rough with the smooth.' Else where's the pleasure in looking back upon the hardships afterwards? I should prefer a little civilised Christian comfort at the moment, said Lady Fanshawe tartly, as she sought to straighten her sodden and dishevelled hair. Right-o, answered Mike, seeking a satisfactory compromise. We'll push on until we find a dry barn to sleep in. How will that do? Sir Edward and his wife agreed grudgingly, and the caravans proceeded on their way down the wet, white road. Meantime, the dusk was falling, and along field paths and drains, up the declivity of muddy byways, and even along the edges of main roads, thousands upon thousands of bedraggled rodents were making their way toward the heights, fleeing quietly and swiftly from the floodwaters that were rising behind them. At Berkeley, the caravanners found the sort of place they were seeking, an ancient grey stone hay barn standing in its own yard. The ground surrounding the building was waterlogged already, but the barn itself was delightfully dry and fragrant, and into the barn, by dint of a good deal of manoeuvring, they managed to back and manhandle both caravans. The cars were, perforce, left out in the open, which meant that the electric installation run from the engines could not be used. Hurricane lanterns proved but a poor substitute, and no cooking on primus stoves was possible on account of the surrounding hay. But, despite the fact that their supper had to come out of tins, and that everything was wet in the Halliday's caravan, which had sprung a leak in several places, the barn was, at least, dry and warm, so that the whole party felt decidedly more cheerful as they settled down. After supper, Lady Fanshawe, less thoughtful than Mary, shook the crumbs from the table out onto the floor of the barn. A moment later, a big brown rat appeared to garner this unexpected harvest. Like a flash of lightning, Pongo, Michael Halliday's Celium Terrier, shot out of the caravan and made short work of the intruder. "'Oh! A rat! A rat!' squealed Mona Fanshawe. "'For heaven's sake, let's get out of this place! I'm simply terrified of the beastly things!' "'You might well be scared if we were in Africa,' grinned Mike. "'For where there are rats, there are also snakes. In Africa, eh, Mary?' His wife shuddered for her husband's words had raised an unpleasantly vivid picture of life as she had lived it in an African grass-hut. Nonetheless, her voice was steady, as she answered, "'Pongo will look after any vermin that are likely to trouble us in this place, won't you, old fellow?' And the dog, hearing his name, lifted his gory muzzle and wagged his stump of a tail. "'Well, what are we going to do about sleeping?' interrupted Sir Edward, anxious to turn his wife's mind to other matters, and added, I suppose, Mike, that you and I had better put up our camp beds among the hay, and then Mary and Mona can have our caravan. Do you think Hector will disturb you, Lady Fanshawe? asked Mary doubtfully. Not a bit, my dear. Just listen to the rain, by God, exclaimed Sir Edward. I bet the yard will be knee-deep in water by the morning. We're right under the shoulder of the hill, and it looked like a watershed when I shut the doors. Please, goodness, the magnetos on the cars won't be flooded when we want to start— Mike answered. "'Do you think there are many rats in this place?' Sir Edward queried when the women folk had turned in. 
There are always a few in every barn, his friend answered, but they've probably cleared out already, or will keep to their holes. Pongo has been busy ratting most of the evening. Good night. Good night, came the answer. And down the narrow, manure-covered lane which led to the grey barn, a living stream came flowing, which looked, in the fitful light of the moon, like a black tidal wave. It was accompanied by eerie squeaks and angry twitterings, and so great was the pressure of that flitting, every moment some rodent, weaker than his fellows, was squeezed up onto the surface of the slowly moving tide of rats. Soon, save for the thrash of the rain upon the slate roof and the howling of the wind, interspersed by the snap and crackle of falling branches, silence reigned supreme. But still the living tide of rats flowed on towards the barn. Once during the night, Michael Halliday started up on his bed, startled from sleep by a long-drawn-out, slithering whoosh, which culminated in a dull thud, and seemed to shake the building. He leaned over and shook his sleeping companion. "'Did you hear anything, Ted?' he queried. "'No. What was it? I thought I heard a thud, and that the building shook. Nonsense, man! That tinned lobster's given you indigestion!' Michael Halliday, half convinced that he had been dreaming, lay down and went to sleep again. Had he but known it, a great slice of the hill overshadowing the barn, washed from its ancient rock foundation, had slid down until stopped by the wall and door of the barn, which it had closed most effectually. And still the black tide of rats, water-driven from the valleys, flowed on, seeking refuge from the storm. Towards dawn, the first fringes of the flitting flowed about the barn. The fact that the only door was blocked by a solid, immovable barrier of earth presented nothing worse than a temporary hindrance to them. There were plenty of holes and crannies through which so small a creature as a rat could enter. Nonetheless, no more than one or two could find shelter from the storm immediately. And, indeed, the pressure of the rodents, whose mass overflowed the yard and still stretched far back up the muddy lane, tended to frustrate the efforts of the first wave to effect an entry. The Celium, even in his sleep, caught the scent of his hereditary enemies, and awoke instantly to furious, barking life. The dog was chained to his master's bed, and his sudden spring forward awakened Michael. "'Lie down and shut up, you old fool,' he admonished, for he was annoyed at being awakened. The dog sank down, cowed by the anger in his master's voice. Halliday fell once more into an uneasy sleep, for the dog lay trembling beside him with half-suppressed growls rumbling continually deep down in his chest. The poor brute, in fact, was hard put to it to restrain his desire to bark, for the rats were pouring in faster and faster, and now the sleeping caravanners were, literally, ringed in by beady, watching eyes that glowed redly. Then something fell with a dull plop from the roof ventilator to the floor of the caravan. A second and a third thud followed. Little Hector screamed as something scurried across his body, and instantly the two women in the caravan awakened. Mary saw the red eyes first, and she screamed and screamed again. There were dozens of these pinpoints in the caravan already, while in the barn itself, indescribable squeakings and rustlings in the hay had broken out immediately her scream was heard. The dog started barking again. Mike Halliday sprang up with a savage oath, and Sir Edward awakened trembling. Both women were screaming now. The child was crying hysterically. The squeaking and squealing of the rats grew louder. Over all rose the shrieking of the gale, backed up by the dull, incessant burden of the falling rain. Then the man from overseas saw the circle of evil red eyes that was closing in upon them, slowly, inch by stealthy inch. "'The door, Ted!' he shouted. "'Get that damned door open!' "'My God, the place is full of rats!' For an instant, the bright beam of an electric torch stabbed through the darkness. A solid black and brown wall of rats was creeping relentlessly forward from every angle of the building. The creatures in front strove frantically to retreat, as the white light focused and blinded their eyes. But there were millions of rats in that flitting. More and more rats poured into the barn every instant— fighting furiously to escape from the lashing rain and the rising water outside, so that sheer weight of numbers from the back drove the front ranks pitilessly forward. Mike's hand dived beneath his pillow, 
and the staccato chatter of the automatic pistol he snatched up let pandemonium loose, for dozens of bats that lived among the dusty roof's beams overhead were disturbed and fluttered wildly to and fro. Lady Fanshawe, leaping from the caravan, added maniacal screams and hysterical laughter to the general uproar, when a bat became entangled in her hair and she felt her bare feet treading upon living rats which bit cruelly into her bare ankles with needle-sharp teeth. Mary, with her son in her arms, stood stock-still, unable to move a step towards her husband, for she was literally engulfed to the knees by the tide of rodents. Then Pongo broke his lead and leapt to the aid of his mistress. In a moment she was free and moving towards Michael, but that was the end of the unfortunate dog. The rats literally flowed over him, squeaking, worrying, biting, and within a minute not a fragment beyond his bones was left. "'The door! Why the hell don't you open the door, Ted?' Michael shouted. "'I can't! It's stuck fast!' The answer was gasped back. Then, in a rising scream, "'Oh, God! I'm up to my waist in rats! I'm being eaten alive!' Again Mike's hand foraged beneath his pillow, found a new clip, and slipped it into the butt of his automatic. And, if the eight shots availed not at all against the rats, the quick series of explosions did at least serve to awaken a number of farmhands and villagers, living in cottages close at hand. They came to the rickyard, armed with lanterns, and fled away again in search of dogs and sticks and shotguns, for they had seen two things— Firstly, that the yard was literally carpeted with the remains of a great flitting of rats, such a flitting as men had never known before, and, secondly, that a low hill standing in the yard had subsided, owing to the rain, completely blocking the only road of escape for the unfortunate caravanners who were thus imprisoned in the barn. By this time, the screams of the baronet had given place to silence, for the rats had pulled him down, and he would scream no more. Lady Fanshawe, fainting from sheer terror, had felt her knees sag, and had sunk into that living black tide from which there could be no rescue. But Mike Halliday, big game hunter and explorer, who had faced a hundred perils clear-eyed and fearless in his time, put out all his mighty strength, and, heaving up his whole light bedstead, literally flailed his way to a spot where he could get his back against a wall, with space enough behind him for Mary to crouch in, holding Hector. The light of his torch was growing dim now. His last clip of cartridges was finished, but he wedged the base of his torch into a crevice of the wall, twisted the legs of his broken bed into a serviceable weapon for his great hands, and fought on so long as the light lasted. Meanwhile, the men outside had purged the yard, and willing hands were digging frantically to clear the door, while shouts of encouragement came to the ears of the man who was fighting grimly for his own life and the lives of his wife and child. Already a mat of dead rodents lay deep about his feet, but ever and ever, as he fought, fresh rats swarmed over the corpses of their kind to attack him. Rats sprang at him from either side, and even dropped from the roof and walls onto his limbs, until there was hardly an inch of the man that was not bleeding. Then, in ones and twos at first, and then in dozens, they stole past him as his strength began to fail. Mary knew their case was hopeless, and made no attempt to fight. This brave woman crouched down with her body covering her child, and let the foul brutes work their will upon her. The quiet fortitude of that mother is something to marvel at. Long before her husband was finished, the thin pyjamas were literally eaten from her body, and then tiny, razor-sharp teeth began nibbling tentatively at her living flesh. The temptation to scream, to kick and strike— anything to drive away that awful agony and the loathsome touch of small, furry bodies, was almost irresistible. But Mary knew that any overt act upon her part would bring the whole swarm of the rats surging over her, and so she endured the last, utmost limit of agony in silence and stillness. For already the heavy blows of axe strokes were falling upon the door, which the caravaner's own hands had barred that night upon the inside, and every second that she endured brought nearer the fulfilment of her hope that Hector might be saved unharmed, for, covered as he was by his mother's body, the child had as yet received no injury. But rats are swift workers. 
the blood flowing freely from the woman's many wounds, the red meat they had already eaten, inflamed to the last degree their carnivorous passions, while the smell of blood set the rearmost ranks that, as yet, had had no share in the fearful feast, surging forward. And, before the great double doors were beaten in, the last shred of that once beautiful woman and most faithful mother Mary Halliday had disappeared. And the child? The rats had fed red too upon his little body when the eager rescuers broke in, and already the flitting was fading away, as such comings do mysteriously pass, through crack and cranny and crevice. And outside, men killed rats until their arms ached from wrist to shoulder with striking. But still the noxious creatures fled away, leaving behind them no trace of the victims they had slain, save little heaps of bones, two deserted caravans, and a broken camp bedstead. At the coming of the dawn, the rain ceased, and the sun shone out, but all was gloom in Berkeley, and, when the coroner had finished his inquiries, the farmer bade his men pull down the grey barn, stone by stone, and burn the hay. For, as he said, after such a happening, the place, if it was allowed to stand, must be for ever after, both haunted and accursed. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.